The Senate will please come to order. A quorum is present. The House will please come to order. A quorum is present. Please take your seats. The House and Senate are meeting in joint session today pursuant to HCR 48, providing for an address by Greg Abbott, the governor of the state of Texas. We are very honored today to have with us Texas First Lady, Cecilia Abbott. We also have some other special guests whom the governor will introduce. I now recognize the Honorable Dan Patrick for the introduction of the governor. It is my privilege and honor to present to you the governor of the state of Texas, Greg Abbott. Thank you all so very much. Lieutenant Governor Patrick, Speaker Strauss, I look forward to working with both of you as we unite to make Texas even better. To the members of the House and the Texas Senate, our co-authors in the next chapter of the greatest state in the United States of America. To the members of the Texas judiciary with whom I once served, to our fellow statewide officers, to our special guests, including my nominee to be the next Secretary of State for the state of Texas, Carlos Cascos. And to all of my fellow Texans, let me start by following up on something that Speaker Strauss mentioned. Let me start by recognizing someone who represents the richness of our heritage, the strength of our values, and the promise that is Texas, the first Hispanic First Lady in the history of this state, my wonderful wife, Cecilia. Well, as your governor, I am proud to report that as the sun arises on 2015, the state of Texas is strong, and to, together, we are about to make it even stronger. We are at the pinnacle of America's economy. Texas has been number one in the nation for creating jobs for so long, it's hard to keep count. But this last year in 2014, we literally outdid ourselves. Last year, Texas created more jobs than in any other year in the history of this great state. And already this year, Reports show that our economic engine continues to gain steam. Last week, our comptroller, Glenn Hager, reported that sales tax revenue in January increased by about 11%, surging to an all-time record. It's the 58th consecutive month of year-over-year -year sales tax growth. The reason why Texas leads the nation 
is because of our greatest natural resource, and that is the people of Texas, the people who have built a strong and diversified economy. Texas leads the nation as a beacon of individual liberty and economic opportunity. Our job is to ensure that we not only keep it that way, but that we work together to make it even better. Earlier today, I submitted a budget that charts a course that will keep Texas number one in the United States of America. You know, we've already seen the important challenges that we face going forward. As we look to some of these challenges, the way I see it is that our journey begins with striving to create the best education system in America. We've seen that we can do it. In Dallas, for example, African-American and Hispanic students pass AP exams at a higher rate than any other place in America. In the Rio Grande Valley, I visited the Idea Westlaco Charter School where about 99% of their high school seniors go on to college. And I'm so very proud to say that the Irving Independent School District has been recognized as the 2015 Advanced Placement District of the Year. Irving is the very best ISD for advanced placement in the entire United States of America. The leader of the Irving ISD is Superintendent Dr. Jose Parra, and he is with us today, and I would like to say congratulations to Dr. Parra on his great leadership of Irving ISD. Together, we must not rest. We must not relent until we replicate successes like this across the entire state. We can be number one in education if we apply the very same tenacity and commitment to education as we have to job creation. I'd like to recognize Will Metcalf from Montgomery County. Will, where are you? Oh. <laughs> Will, congratulations on your election. I think you are unique among your peers because I think you are the youngest member of this body. He was born in 1984. <laughs> and here's the point, though. For his entire life, the state of Texas has been mired in litigation about school funding. Well, members, whether this is your first session or whether you're Tom Craddock, who, by the way, cannot be with us, and our prayers are with him as he continues to recover. But regardless of how long you've served, I think we can all agree it is time to put school finance litigation behind us. It is time to stop fighting about school finance and it's time to start fixing our schools to make them better for our students. <laughs> to improve our schools, we must begin by building a strong foundation from the very beginning. 
Our goal should be to ensure that all students in Texas are performing at grade level in reading and math by the time they finish the third grade. <laughs> to begin that process, my budget provides additional funding for schools that adopt high quality pre-K programs in the state of Texas. My plan also provides pre-K through third grade teachers with world-class literacy and math teacher training programs. I want to thank Senator Judith Zaffarini, Senator Donna Campbell, and Representatives Dan Huberty, Helen Giddings, and Joe Desotel for carrying my pre-K legislation to improve early education. To begin the process of improving our schools and advancing our students, we must improve early education. That's why I am declaring early education as my first emergency item as governor of Texas. Now another essential ingredient to better schools is ensuring that we have the best teachers in our classrooms. In part, that means saying no to Common Core in classrooms in Texas. We can bring out the best in all of our teachers by getting rid of these one-size-fits-all mandates and trusting our teachers to truly educate the students in the classroom. So my budget invests more in teachers who focus on STEM-related subjects and teachers who serve our most disadvantaged students. And we must also return genuine local control to the school districts in Texas. Now I know that last session you all took a big step in that direction. This year, let's take another big step. This book right here contains all of the education related laws in Texas. It is absurd to micromanage educators with all of these laws. Let's cut those laws down to size by allowing school districts to opt out of parts of the education code so they can design an education plan that best fits their community needs. <laughs> Local control, however, doesn't end at the school district level. Real local control rests with parents. Parental involvement is critical to student advancement. The ultimate parental involvement is giving parents more choices in their children's education. No one said that better than Keisha Riley from Houston, Texas. She tearfully pleaded for the opportunity to send her young daughter to a better school. Keisha said, and I want to quote her, having a school in my area that doesn't fit my needs is frustrating. It makes me feel helpless because I want her to be in a good school and I want her to get a good education so that she doesn't have to struggle like I have.
As Keisha spoke, her little girl reached up and literally wiped away a tear that was streaming down her mother's cheek. This story forces us to look into the eye of Keisha and ask ourselves, are we working for her and her daughter or are we working for the status quo in the state of Texas? The truth is, when parents have more options, students win. There are plenty of examples. Let me give you one. Grand Prairie ISD is an open enrollment school district that allows parents to choose the school that is best for their children. And the results show substantial improvement in student achievement. Grand Prairie ISD's graduation rates improved dramatically over seven years with 20% point gains among Hispanic, African American, and economically disadvantaged students. Our parents deserve these choices. Our students deserve these results. Now, we also want to see more of our high school graduates go on to college. To assist that goal, we must make college more affordable and more accessible. We must restrain the spiraling cost of higher education so more Texans can reap the rewards that come from going to college. Just like with primary and secondary education, Higher education does not work in a one-size-fits-all approach. Different students have different needs. And our employers are demanding that we better prepare our students for the real-life workforce needs. For many, a two-year degree is far more than just a piece of paper. It is a key that opens the door to economic freedom. As just one recent example, a young man named Justin Friend attended Texas State Technical College in Waco and received a two-year certificate in welding. In 2013, in his first full year on the job, this young man made about $130,000. Last year, in his second year, he made about $140,000. So I'm thinking, if this governor thing doesn't work out, I'm going to TSTC and getting myself a welding certificate. <laughs> The fact is, not everybody needs a four-year college degree. So we need to expand and support our community colleges that serve as the gateway to better jobs and as a step toward further education opportunities. And then we also must focus on elevating the national research standing of our universities in this state. The budget that I submitted today jumpstarts the process of elevating Texas higher education into the highest echelons in America by committing a half a billion dollars to enhance research programs and attract nationally recognized researchers and Nobel laureates to Texas universities. The trail for this game-changing success has already been blazed. The Chancellor's Research Initiative at the Texas A&M System has been recruiting the world's foremost research scholars to College Station and Prairie View A&M. 
including three Nobel laureates and 11 members of national academies. One of these great minds is with us here today. Dr. Chris Flutus, a member of the National Academy of Engineering. He was recruited from Princeton and serves as the new director of A&M's Energy Institute. Please welcome Dr. Flutus. Because of the vital role that higher education plays in transforming our state, I'm declaring higher education research initiatives my second emergency item. Now, in addition to educating our students, another fundamental responsibility of government is to build the roads that Texas need to travel on. With the passage of Proposition 1 this past year, Texans sent a loud and clear message that they are tired of being stuck in traffic. It's a sad day in Texas when a guy in a wheelchair can go faster than some of our traffic stuck on some of our congested roads. <laughs> My budget adds more than $4 billion a year to build more roads in Texas without raising a single penny in taxes, fees, tolls, or debt. This. This funding comes from three places. One is the funding received from Proposition 1. Two, it ends the diversion of state highway funds. Tax dollars paid for roads should be spent on building more roads. Third is that my plan constitutionally dedicates half of the existing motor vehicle sales tax to fund roads. The plan, including the constitutional amendment, is needed to ensure that TxDOT has the sustainable, recurring, and predictable revenue needed to plan large-scale, multi-year construction projects. Now, regardless of the priorities that we have in the Capitol this year. The voters made unequivocally clear their priority. They want more roads funded. And I want to thank Senator Robert Nichols and Representatives Joe Pickett and Larry Phillips for your work to make this happen. Because this funding is so essential to the people of Texas, I am declaring transportation as my third emergency item. Now, when it comes to our state's responsibilities, our first and foremost obligation is to protect our citizens' safety. We cannot be naive to the threat posed by drug cartels, transnational gangs, and human smuggling and trafficking operations. In the face of such evil, we cannot respond with apathy, but with resolve. One of my many visits to the Rio Grande Valley, I met a young Latina who pleaded with me to keep my promise to secure the border. She told me a story about her younger brother being involved in a pickup soccer game where the kids were choosing up teams. 
But one of the boys to be chosen was the son of a known cartel member. Should her brother pick the boy to play for his team? What would be the consequence if he did? What would be the consequence if he didn't? Our children should not have to make these types of choices. We cannot fail that young Latina. We cannot fail our fellow Texans. We must do what the federal government has failed to do. We must secure our border. The first step in securing our border is enforcing the rule of law. Along those lines, the very last lawsuit that I filed as Attorney General was a lawsuit to stop President Obama's lawless executive action. I'm proud to report that late last night, a federal judge halted the president's executive action plan. In Texas, we will not sit idly by while the president ignores the law and fails to secure the border. That's why I have a comprehensive border security plan. My plan more than doubles the spending on securing the border. It has 500 new state troopers, more Texas Rangers who can focus on corruption, more funding for local law enforcement, more for technology to stop the transnational criminal activity that threatens every community in Texas by hiring more DPS troopers for border security. It allows officers displaced from places like Longview and Lubbock and from around the state to return to their own communities to keep them safe. It also expands the anti-gang efforts across the state, helping us to disrupt gangs in places like Houston and Dallas, San Antonio and right here in Austin. This legislation is essential, which is why I'm declaring border security funding as my fourth emergency item. But the reality is that the DPS could not recruit, train, and deploy 500 new troopers overnight. It takes time to ramp that up. That's why this morning before our gathering here, I met with the commanding general of the Texas National Guard and the director of the Texas Department of Public Safety. And I ordered them as your commander in chief to remain deployed on the border until my border security plan is implemented. As governor, I have identified the funds needed to keep the National Guard in place until the legislature acts. As soon as the DPS has the permanent resources needed to secure our border, then we can bring home our dedicated National Guard troops. We must remember the hardship that such long deployment puts on our National Guard troops on their families, and on their careers. We should all be deeply grateful for their dedicated service. With us today is the commander of our National Guard, General John Nichols, and the director of Texas DPS, Colonel Steve McCraw. And through them, let us show our thanks to the men and women who've been serving on the front lines to secure our border.
The National Guard is part of the larger forces that secure our safety and protect our freedom. America is the brightest beacon of freedom the world has ever known because of men and women who have worn the uniform. Some are in this room today. I'd like to start out by recognizing any member of the state legislature, House, Senate, or statewide official who has ever worn the uniform of the United States military, would you please stand? And any others, is there anybody else in this chamber today who's ever worn the uniform of the United States military? Let us thank you too. Because of those who fought on battlefields around the globe, we have the freedom to fight on the battleground of ideas in capitals like this. But no generation represents that more than the greatest generation, those who brought us through World War II. A few of those heroes still remain. But one is with us today. I'd like to recognize a very special guest who is now 108 years young, our nation's oldest World War II veteran, ladies and gentlemen, a great Texan, Mr. Richard Overton. Saying thank you is great and a lot of fun, but it's not enough for those who risk their lives for us. We must do more to help our veterans return to civilian life. You know, it's amazing when you think about it that Texas leads the nation in job creation, and yet the unemployment rate for our veterans remains startlingly high. That is unacceptable. That's why my budget exempts new businesses formed by veterans from having to pay state registration fees to open new businesses in Texas. My budget also exempts new businesses formed by veterans from paying the state franchise taxes for the first five years. And I'm calling for legislation to waive licensing exams and fees for veterans with the required education, training, and practical experience that they gained in the military. If the
If the training they received as an electrician, a technician, or some other job is good enough for the United States military, by God, it is good enough for the state of Texas. We must also do more for our veterans who return broken from battle. The fact is that not all wounds are seen. My budget includes funding to provide mental health screenings to veterans and service members to help them deal with some of their deepest wounds. But I think we all know in this chamber that it's not just our veterans who need better access to health care. We also need to provide more funding for women's health programs. For For more access to care like cancer screenings and checkups, my budget provides that additional funding. My budget, also, my budget also increases funding for the treatment of postpartum depression. And to get and keep more doctors in Texas, my budget increases funding for residency programs. And to help people with disabilities and our seniors, my budget adds more for funding for in-home care attendants. Now we as a group, we can do all of this while still fostering the economic model that creates more jobs than any other state. While our job creation is legendary, many states are overhauling their economic development programs to compete with Texas. We will rise to that challenge by making the Texas Enterprise Fund more efficient, more effective, and more transparent to help grow jobs even more in the state of Texas. If a business receives a grant from the Texas Enterprise Fund, taxpayers must know that that decision was based only on the merit of the business. But I think most of us agree that the best way to create more jobs is to permanently reduce the business franchise tax in Texas. I will reject any budget that does not include genuine tax relief for Texas employers and job creators. And I will also insist on property tax reduction for Texas. It is time for property owners, not government, to truly own their own property. My plan calls for a $2 billion reduction in the business franchise tax and a $2.2 billion reduction in the property tax burden. And importantly, Donna Howard, My budget includes an appropriation that makes school districts whole for any tax revenue they may lose. But the property tax reduction must be lasting. We cannot allow it to evaporate with rising property valuations.
and Senator Eltif to keep Texas fiscally strong, the time has come to begin reducing our state's debt. <laughs> debt today becomes taxes tomorrow. Debt service unnecessarily burdens our state's budget and it limits the economic freedom of future generations. We must begin the process now to create a structure to pay down our state's debt. Now to keep Texas the premier model for opportunity, we must also constrain the size of government and maximize the liberty of individuals. To protect taxpayers from government growing too big, the time has come for a constitutional amendment that limits the growth of the state budget to population growth plus inflation. <laughs> Texas families have to live within a budget. Government should too. Now many of us in this room, including myself, have ridiculed states like California and Illinois as bastions of failed big government. You'll probably be as surprised as I was to learn that Texas has more full-time state employees per capita than California and Illinois. That was shocking. And I think it must be changed. That's why my budget requires most state agencies to reduce general revenue spending by at least 3%. Some of those cuts can come from hiring freezes and reductions in fuel and travel costs. Now, accepted from these budget cuts, our public and higher education formula spending, pension obligations, and amounts required by the federal entitlement programs. To lead by example, I am cutting the governor's office budget by more than 10%. I can do it, other agencies in the state of Texas can do it too. The more that we restrain the growth of government, the more we empower hardworking Texans. <laughs> These budget cuts will make our budget even leaner while also helping us to prioritize spending that will make our state even stronger. <laughs> now let me briefly follow up on a word that I mentioned moments ago. It's the word liberty. That one word encapsulates what America is all about. That word symbolizes the state of Texas. I look forward to expanding liberty in Texas by signing a law that makes Texas the 45th state in America to allow open carry. I want to mention one last topic. Let's dedicate this session to ethics reform. I want to work with you so that we can together strengthen the faith and trust that Texans deserve from us. It's a reminder of who we really work for, and that is the citizens of Texas. My blueprint that has outlined every single issue I've talked about today, as well as so many more, includes ethics reforms like requiring elected officials to disclose contracts 
they may have with public entities, prohibiting lawmakers from voting on legislation from which they could profit, and more disclosure of campaign finance information. I want to thank Senator Van Taylor and Representative Charlie Guerin for spearheading the effort to pass my blueprint ethics reforms. And when you think about it, the most important commodity that we have as elected officials is the bond that we share with our constituents. Transparency and rising above the appearance of impropriety will strengthen that bond. But rejection of ethics reform could weaken that bond and rightfully raise suspicions about who we truly serve, ourselves or the people of Texas. Because these ethics reforms are so important, I'm adding them to my list of emergency items. Let me just conclude by saying this. I know that there are many people in this room who have heard me say before that our lives are not measured by the ways in which we are challenged. Instead, we get to determine our lives by the way that we respond to the challenges we face. That principle applies to all of us in this room here today. It applies to the work that we are undertaking during this legislative session. Our fellow Texans face many challenges the need for better schools, for more roads, for border security, better health care, more jobs. They want more liberty and less government, and they deserve ethics reforms. We cannot let their future be defined by these challenges. Instead, it is our responsibility to work together to respond to these challenges. Texas needs us to succeed. America needs us to succeed. Working together, we will succeed, and we will keep Texas the beacon state in the United States of America. May God bless you all, and may God continue to bless the great state of Texas as we work together this session for greater success. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you.